that link these subjects, um, diffusion is something that links, links both subjects mathematically. Uh, personally, there are problems that I encounter at study groups. Um, the other thing is that they are two of the best problems I've encountered at study groups in terms of the mathematics that they generated. And I suppose this is this two sides to this equation that Bruce has mentioned this as well and, and Graham is that sometimes the study groups generate interesting mathematical problems. Sometimes they don't. And I guess I chose these two because I thought they were interesting and the, some interesting work arose out of them. So, um, yeah, so these were case studies from mathematics and industry study groups that are held in Australia and New Zealand. And I'll talk to you about um, crispy cereals first and then submarine batteries second. Uh, oh, yeah, and the, well, the good thing about the other good thing about crispy cereals is that there's plenty of um, internet images. Um, with cereals. In fact, cereals is a big business. If you collect um, cereal boxes in the, in, the, in the USA, and if you have an original cereal box from the 1960s, they can be worth thousands of dollars now. Okay. Yeah, un unopened. Unopened with uh, perhaps a sticker of the Beatles inside it, then maybe $2,000 for this cereal box, if it's been kept carefully in a cupboard. And some people do that. Some people collect cereal boxes over the years, and they hold them like a fine painting. I don't eat the yes, cereal. I clean it up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so when your mother says, eat your cereal, you say, no, 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 no. It's a splinter's item. It must be So uh, the subtitle is uh, not only the fusion in, in whole cereal grains. So um, this is that's a modified version of the talk I gave at the study group. Uh, you work, you know, many of you know, know the procedure at the study group. Uh, on Monday, you, you get told about a problem. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you work on the problem together in a workshop environment, so working in a small room, talking and writing. And on Friday, present results. And this is a little bit um, the, the results that were presented on Friday. So it was a study group that was in, in 1996 in Melbourne. It was my first, it was my first study group. Um, I guess I've been to one or two before, but I began to go seriously after the study group because my experience was I had so much fun at the study group. So Uncle Toby's was the company that came, and um, here are some of their uh, some of their products. They're big in Australia, quite big in New Zealand as well. Not just cereals, but muesli bars, snacks, that sort of thing. Um, and they take it well. It's big money, so they take it very seriously. And their concern was that the, the early part of preparing. The grains, when the whole grains, they would cook them first, then later they squeeze them, toast them, add sugar, and, and do other processing. The first thing is cooking them. And that was what they were worried about. Um, they cooked them in a big steam pressure cooker, uh, one ton of uh, grains at once, add some water, cook it for an hour, uh, typically for one hour, pressure cooker. So high pressure, not, not much water, but so it's really a steam environment. And it was a bottleneck for their process. Now, their factory was getting quite old. It wasn't far from Melbourne. But the Melbourne was the, the uh, University of Melbourne was where the study group was, and um, their factory was close by. And it was getting old, maybe 20 or 30 years old. And they were thinking about replacing their equipment. And um, I guess they were fairly thinking a long way ahead because they were conscious that they didn't have a good mathematical understanding or physical, even perhaps physical. But they wanted a mathematical model of the um, of the uh, pressure cooking process of whole grain cereals. And as I say, yes, they're going to upgrade their equipment, and they wanted to do it in, in an informed way. So a mathematical model was their idea. Cooking is heating and wetting the grain, as you know. You want to cook rice, it goes into the pot, and there's a lot of water involved as well. No water, it won't cook. So it needs to be hot and wet to, to cook. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, what they wanted was to cook faster because it was a bottleneck for the factories. They were waiting for this pressure cooker to finish and then they could uh, empty it and put another load in. And so they wanted faster cooking, but they also wanted more accurate cooking uh, or uniform cooking. Um, you know, cooking from the outside in, so by the time the inside is cooked, the outside is perhaps a little overcooked. So uh, how can they fix that? Was they were thinking. Uh, more accurate cooking, more uniform, more accurate cooking. And the reason for that was, well, there's two reasons. If it's undercooked, it doesn't taste so good. Um, you know that uh, rice, if it's not cooked properly, of course, the modern rice cooker, there's no problem, right? 
I discovered the wonders of a rice cooker when I came here to Christ. Uh, I didn't, didn't know what I, I used to boil rice in a pot, and sometimes it would be undercooked, and if you bite it, it's crunchy and it doesn't taste so good. But the rice cooker, you put the water in, put the rice in, turn it on, and you walk away. You know, and then three yes. minutes later, it's just magic. It's just beautiful <laughs> rice. And, uh, you know, my wife says, how did we ever do without one before? You know, she came, because she's been to Korea. And, and uh, yeah, I was surprised. See, uh, Kil Kwan was helping us set up the uh, apartment uh, many, uh, eight years ago. And, uh, you know, what, what do we need? Oh, we need a microwave. We need, a, we need cutlery. We need pots and pans. And, but, of course, no, no, no. Kil says, no, no, you need a rice cooker. I said, what? Why do we need a rice cooker? <laughs> but we did. We needed a rice cooker. We just didn't know it. So uh, raw tastes worse, but if you overcook, um, this is the crispy cereal connection, if the cereal is cooked too long, um, it, it turns out that you know, it's starch, cereal is starch, and it's long, those long chain polymers starch. And if you overcook it, you break the chains to short chain starches, maybe even sugars. And um, short chain doesn't stay crisp. If you add water, add milk uh, to your cereal, and then you've overcooked it, the whole, and the company's overcooked it, then it goes soggy very quickly. And they just knew they knew that from experience as well. Overcooking gives soggy cereal. Accurate cooking, just cooked, gives crispy cereal. Stays crisp longer, and those snap, crackle, pop rice bubbles can snap, crackle, and pop much longer, and your cornflakes can be oh, crunch, crunch, crunch. I don't know, I mean, sometimes it's very annoying hearing the crunch, 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 but, <laughs> but, but uh, the customer doesn't like it if it goes soggy too soon. Yeah. Actually, I, I eat Wheat Bix in New Zealand, that we have a product called Wheat Bix. Uh, it's like Wheat Bix, but it's Wheat Bix in New Zealand. It's just New Zealand and Australia has this Wheat Bix. And I add milk, hot milk, and I wait till it goes soggy. Then I eat it. So, like porridge, I like it soft. So, I had no, uh, no personal interest in this, in this uh, research at all. Yeah. I prefer it soggy. But, uh, but the company certainly was interested in, in cooking crispy cereal. And so we learned, the first thing we learned about was how to, when you cook uh, a grain of something, wheat, barley, or rice, or corn, um, that you have to change its chemical structure by a process, through a process called gelatinization. Uh, and actually, it's a crystal, it's a crystal, the, the crystal structure of the starch changes in a way that you can detect optically. Um, there's a relationship between how hot you should make the, the grain, so there's a degree C, 50 degrees C, 150 degrees C, and how wet you should make the grain. So there's no water in the grain and all water in the grain. And so typically it comes up, uh, grain's about 15% moisture by some measure. Um, and so you want to add water and get it up to the point where, say, 60 or 80 degrees, it will cook. Um, if you cook it in low moisture, you get a different product as well. Look, puff wheat, for example, you don't add any water, you just heat it up. There's some water in there, and it goes puffy, and it's a different structure. But the same um, change in, um, in crystal structure, even though the physical structure is different. So, um, so there's a relationship between how hot and how wet it should be to be cooked. And this, this line is actually, uh, you know, it's quite wide because it's not just one starch, but there are many starches, and so there's, you know, there's some spread. There's a grey area of cooking. This line is quite thick, about 10 degrees C thick. Um, and it's different for different grains, a little bit as well. So, um, so we learned about that heat and moisture required, that there's a swelling going on as well, so when you cook this grain, as you know, the rice grain, doubles in size, and the, the, the granules inside, the, the starch granules that are packed inside, actually burst in an irreversible transition uh, at the cooking point. If you don't go that high, it's reversible. When you go through this transition, this gelatinization, it's irreversible to change. First, it's irreversible above the cooking temperature. So it's long chain polymer, and you want to keep the long chains, not shorten them too much by overcooking. So the first thing we did, even on Monday, perhaps on Tuesday morning, was to consider some very simple property, some of the simple aspects of the question. Um, we know that you know we're heating the grain and we're wetting it, or they're heating the grain and they're wetting it at the same time. Um, they had a mental model, and I'll, I'll just draw this for you. Um, the mental model they had of the process was that here's a, um, here's a grain cereal. And you have steam on 
the outside, and the steam goes in. They drew a picture like this for us, and, and then the steam is penetrated. After some time, the steam has gone this far. So the steam goes in, and it drops its heat, its latent heat, by condensing in the grain. So they're thinking of latent heat, the steam. So then their mental picture of their mental model of what was going on. They had a, a front here where the water was the water had reached and the heat had reached. Same place. So steam and heat together. That was their mental model of what was going on. Which you know, and, and at first I thought, you know, they showed us this and said, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, the steam goes up, oh right, yeah. And yes, if you, you steam something, it hurts, how? It drops its heat, you know, on your, on your hand, it hurts. So yeah, it's a, it's a seem like a good model. Until we go back to basics, and you think, well, thermal conductivity, you know. What's the temperature of the surface of this? Forget the steam, what's the temperature? It's 100, 120 degrees. So, uh, okay, well, heat's going to go in by another means as well, doesn't it? It doesn't have to go with the steam. It can go in by conduction. And of course, very quickly, uh, people in our group were saying, well, what about thermal conductivity? Just thermal conduction. What about that process for heating the grain? So, you know, with thermal conductivity, thermal conductivity, all these numbers were there and they were given to us by the company. Uh, and we looked up some looked up some papers to get a moisture diff some moisture diffusivities. Moisture diffusivity was a little bit um, trickier because it's, it depends on it, it's nonlinear. So the, the diffusivity depends on the moisture content. Yeah. It increases dramatically exponentially with moisture content. But the other we can average that, take some rough value. And we can estimate the time to wet and the time to heat. And that was, um, you know, that took us an hour or two. And the reason it took so long was because we made mistakes. So you do it again. A simple calculation, though, you know, your diffusion equation, linear, to first approximation, just linear time scale. What's the time scale? In L squared over uh, uh, d, uh, d is L squared over t, so the time scale is L squared over d. Yeah. So you just we know the size, so we can estimate the time scale. Um, so yeah, so conduction of heat, um, conduction of moisture, diffusivity of moisture is a little more complicated, but, but just to take a linear approximation and just ask roughly what sort of time is involved. And, and very quickly we saw that for, you know, it doesn't matter much what you're talking about, the, the heating time was seconds. Now you know if you want to cook rice, it's not going to take seconds, it's going to take 20 minutes. Yeah. And that's the wetting time. So we did various approximations to the wetting and we found it was 7 minutes, 145 minutes, 20 minutes. So yeah, there's a big range, but it didn't matter. The difference was, was quite, um, you know, 60 times different. So heating is fast, wetting is slow. And that was, uh, that was a shock, I think, to the company, Uncle Toby's engineers. They're still thinking of the steam going and dropping its heat. As a mental model, it, was, it ignored some important things. It ignored heat conduction, for example. So that was the first day. Um, it was quite nice to make such a, 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 I mean, it was simple mathematics, right? But, but the, the implications for the company were, were very powerful. Uh, things like, oh, they're waiting for it to get wet. They were thinking they're waiting for it to get hot. But no, they're waiting for it to get wet. So we can talk about pre-wetting the grains, you know, how can we speed up the process, you know, separate the heating and wetting processes. Well, it turns out it's not quite that simple. You know, if you put rice in cold water, it doesn't get very wet inside. You, know, you should try it sometime. You can't really pre-wet these things. The, the rate at which moisture goes in is very temperature dependent, so the, these two are coupled, these processes are coupled anyway. But the idea, anyway, that the, that the wetting was the, was the limiting factor and they could perhaps put warm water around it and pre-wet it and then later, um, then later heat it up. The heating is not, not the issue. So it was a big surprise, big surprise for, for Uncle Toby's. For us, of course, we could now relax a little bit. It was Tuesday, we had three more days, and we had already given them some really good information. So now we could do some mathematics, right, and not worry too much about what the company wanted. No, no, we still did worry, but, but we could have more fun than, than otherwise. There's a lot of responsibility in these industrial problems, the two you know, We're working on a problem that the answers should not be, oh, here's a nice model. It doesn't quite solve your problem, but it's a nice model, mathematically. They don't want to know that. You know, they want to know what's the answer to our problem. And so we had some answers for them already, and we could relax a bit about 
the modelling we did. So we thought we'd have some fun, and um, I've gone backwards, and we um, decided to look more closely at the fact that we have a non-linear diffusivity for the grain wetting. So it's now, we're now focused, the heating is really not of so much interest anymore, but the wetting is of interest. And mathematically we thought, well this is interesting because you know, the diffusivity, according to um, a publication that one of the students had brought along, we were lucky, you know, someone had brought along some grain drying publications and they were just the right things. Some very careful experiments have been done to measure the diffusivity of grain experimentally. Just take a piece of corn, attach a tube to it, let the moisture penetrate it, weigh, weigh it as the moisture penetrates, um, and then model that with a 3D model allowing D to be uh, something times an exponential behaviour and then fit the constants uh, numerically. Quite nice, nice work. And we were lucky to have access to that, to that paper at, at this time. And that's the other aspect of the study groups. Luck, I think, plays a big role. Having the right people there at the right time, sometimes that's just lucky. Having the right publication, and someone knows about publication, and brings it along and says, oh, I saw this. But sometimes that's just lucky. Feels lucky. Sometimes the organiser has gone and done some preparation, and has gone to the computer and has done some searches and has some papers for you. You still have to read them, you still have to try and understand them in a very short time. Um, but so we were lucky, I think, to have access to this information. So there's M is the moisture content. It's, uh, you can think of it, um, there's two, two measurements for moisture, the dry basis and the wet basis. Dry basis is the amount of water divided by the amount of dry grain. Uh, wet basis is the amount of water divided, or the mass of water, if you like, divided by the mass of water plus grain. There's those two measures, and this, they relate to each other, and you can go from one to the other. I think this is wet basis, and M appears in D, with E to the 8.6M. So, so. And the idea is that as you wet the grain, it becomes, the diffusivity goes up. So it gets e very easy to go to put water through the wet pit, but it's very hard for water to get into the dry bit, so you get this very steep front penetration of the grain. We're thinking about steep fronts, and it's, shock, it's kind of a shock, almost shock theory, you know, shock waves. Um, it's called a MESA problem in diffusivity, a non linear diffusivity, and um, the idea that you might get a, a, a sharp front across which all your moisture was traveling, or that the changes in moisture were, were happening. That was the idea. Um, so, um, we also were interested in the fact that the grain swells, and we knew that that factor, in you know, a factor of two of swelling, that the swelling was important. So we've got a nonlinear diffusion equation with a um, moving boundary. Okay. And the boundary moves according to how much water goes in, is the model. So the starch is there, and the water comes in, and the swelling is due to the water going in. That's why it swells up. So there's a mass conservation giving you the swelling. So you get R by solving for it, by solving the diffusion equation. But you have to solve the diffusion equation knowing what R is. So then they're coupled and it's a moving boundary problem. Oops. Not only because of that exponential dependence of, uh, on moisture. So, the, uh, yes, it was a very serious business too, you can see. Um, so, um, you know, people like Colin Please uh, from the University of Southampton would, would straight away begin to write down conservation of mass equations for the solid and the liquid. And the standard equations, you know, they become familiar after a while. This is conservation of mass, and then put them together and manipulate them a bit and combine. And what you need to know is the velocity. And that's where this paper by Ciari was useful because you could um, infer velocity from the diffusivity measurements he'd done. Diffusivity means how fast something goes up, means velocity, uh, Darcy velocity, if you like through a porous medium. So the model was, actually, it's interesting to think about what does water go into grain? You know, people were thinking, oh, it's a porous medium. And so, you know, capillary pressure and stuff like that. But no, no, you know, you think about pressure driving it in. No, the water's all the way around. And there's air, if you're going to talk about it being a porous medium, then you've got air inside there, right? Well, you know, the water's not going to go in because the air's in the way. So what's the mechanism? What's the physics of what's going on? And it turns out that the, the, well, perhaps the correct way to think of it is there's an action potential. It's a chemical uh, potential. And you know, the, when the water moves in, it's lowering the chemical potential. It's lowering the, So it's driven by an action potential, not by a pressure gradient, actually. 
so uh, concentration gradient, uh, sort of a chemical um, force, if you like, an action potential, not a pressure gradient. And it's interesting that we, we, we did that because, um, you know, I've seen, since then I've seen models of pasta cooking, for example, where this sort of nonlinear diffusion equation is used, but they talk about pressure gradient driving the water into the pasta. I'm thinking, no, how can that be? You know, if the pasta's got air in it, you've got to get the air out before the water can go in. Where's the pressure gradient coming from? You know, capillary pressure? Well, that's okay if, you're, if, you can, if, you know, if the air is not in the way, you know. And so that's the conceptual, um, there are conceptual things to deal with in this. And luckily, again, luckily, we had people who knew enough chemistry to do the conceptual modelling properly. So you put together those equations and, and the information about velocity, and it takes a page or two, but not too much manipulation, to get this nice equation. So the DDT of the rational function of moisture content is two derivatives of here, one there, one there. Nonlinear diffusivity, it looks a bit, a bit nasty now because it's been more carefully done. Even beta ram was coming in there. That was, that was CREF's model, but we found that if you're going to do the mass conservation properly, you wind up with this quadratic you know, thing on the bottom line too. But still, a nonlinear diffusion equation with um, a boundary that moves. So we've got two fronts. We've got a front of the outside boundary, and we've got a wedging front going in as well. Two fronts of interest, really. So, let's see. And, oh, okay, so things have been non dimensionalized and parameters have been identified there, but you don't need to worry about those things. Um, then we had this, this complicated model, and we looked at how can we, how can we solve it. Um, so, one thing to do was to take, well, let's go back to this very simplest case that it's not swelling. We know it is swelling, but let's try mathematically to do the non swelling case. And that corresponded mathematically to sending the density of the water to infinity, so it doesn't take up any space. It goes in without taking up any space, forcing the expansion. So that was a, a nice problem to do, because then the previous complicated equation simplifies to this one. The loss of quadratic would, would simplify this term here as well. It's still modeling diffusion, but it's a little tidier, and it's got fixed boundaries. It's not a fixed domain. So mathematically, that's nice. It's still, at least, it's nicer. Why I liked it was um, that <laughs> it's now ready to have this very nice technique used on it, uh, mean action time idea. And this was a technique that I knew about through the work of uh, Alex McNabb and Graham Wake uh, from New Zealand, both New Zealanders, had been doing some work on cooking chicken. Was yeah, it yeah, heating, freezing, thawing, and thawing of foods. Thawing and freezing of foods. And strange right. shaped foods, so yeah. lamb and chicken and. And, and the idea is that we want, we're not really wanting to solve for moisture. We want to know how long it takes to wet it. What's the time it's taken? What's the mean action time, as it turns out? And you can define the mean action time in this way. Uh, think of this. If you had a constant diffusivity, this is the diffusivity here. You integrate that, you've got d times m. Right? Take the derivative of that, you've got dm dt, with a diffusivity on the front. What does this do? It picks up places where m changes suddenly. Okay, so the moisture's coming in, and we take, we, we have this, which picks up the time at which, at this point in the grain, the moisture goes up. And then you normalize upon this. So that's what the, this time is, in fact. You say, okay, where am I in the grain? Oh, I'm halfway in. Right, here comes the water. When's it going to get to me? Oh, here's the front coming through, and I approximate that front perhaps by, you know, here's the front coming through, but I approximate as a shock with equal areas, and that's a nice interpretation of this mean action time. So the mean action time is a very natural thing to do. It steps back from, I don't know the solution everywhere, but I now ask the question at this point in the grain, what's the time taken to wet it? What's the time taken for the water to get there? And built in behind this is the idea too that you have a very low diffusivity here and a very high diffusivity here. The change is quite rapid and it's like a shock front coming. And it seems to be a reasonable sort of approximation. But what's really nice about this is that if you make this substitute, if you consider this variable T star and, and um, apply this differential equation, it becomes a linear, the Poisson equation, a linear equation with only one variable of x. Of course, only one variable. We integrate it out of time. You say, of course, only one variable. 
but the nonlinearity goes away. Yeah. Um, and there it is there. It's gone away because we put it in. It's also Kirchhoff transformation, I think. It's, it's, like, it's a Kirchhoff transformation. It's, it's based on Kirchhoff transformation. Anyway. That's how we thought it. Yeah, is that? Yeah. Well, the, to me, it's just magic. Anyway, you, you do that, and um, you, you can, okay, you, res, you rescale time to this thing, but what you get is del squared of the, the time to wet is minus one. Poisson equation. And you, know, you can solve that. Spheres, ellipses, cylinders, the solutions abound. And you, you can write them down. So um, it's, it's a magic bullet for answering the question, how long to wet the brain? Yeah. So that was the mathematical was nice, but we've ignored swelling. We've said it's not swelling, and we've limited ourselves to, okay, it's, it's dry or it's wet. So bang, bang, sort of solution. But it was a nice result, and it was a nice application of that technique that had been developed um, well, only a few, about 10 years earlier. Yeah, 87. It's going to be reprinted as a classic. Well, I think it should be, yeah. yeah. It's nice we introduced that idea in 87. Yeah. Freezing of chlorine foods. Yeah. Was there a company involved with that work, or were you just. Sorry? Was that, were you working for a company at the time? Uh, I was working for a um, refrigeration engineers, but yeah. academic refrigeration engineers. Yeah. Okay. Thomas and North. Thomas and North. Alex yeah. and Bruce's. Yeah. So we had some fun with this. Too. I mean, the other thing was to think about what about um, the fact that it's swelling? The, the water is not infinitely dense. The ground is swelling. What about the moving boundary problem? And the fact that you've got a sharp front allows you to think about well, let's do some approximations, some asymptotics on on the problem. So let's try um, let's make it an infinite cylinder, just reduce the dimensionality of the problem, and we'll, we'll take that. In the high diffusivity wet region, here's the water moving into the grain. And high diffusivity here, low diffusivity here. Um, take it to be that the diffusivity is so high that you almost steady state here. Except for the movement of the front, it's a steady state um, diffus diffusion solution here. Um, nearly constant flux, in other words, in the wet region. So it's so a steady state problem in the wet region, and then do the conservation of mass across the, across the shop front and have zero water in front of it. Uh, or zero here. Just that moves forward because of the water arriving to it, not because of anything else. So it's an approximation to the um, to the actual situation. Uh, we use mass conservation and the, the nice thing is that even though the problem looks so horrible, and this was the first equation we wrote down with swelling. Um, that when you again use something like Kirchhoff transformation, well, this is Kirchhoff transformation. That's now the term we're dealing with this diffusivity. If you consider this integral of that uh, as to be g of n, just define g of n by that. It turns out that you can write g of n in terms of uh, initial value and uh, where you are, how deep you are in the grain, and capital R, which is this outside boundary of the grain, and S, which is the wetting front coming in. So. You can, you can solve it with that. So we have this G, as that we have dr dt is given by a, the gradient of moisture, and we have ds dt. So dr dt is the rate at which you're swelling the grain, ds dt is the rate at which you're penetrating the grain with water. Okay. And yes, this, this parameter is in there, this is algebra. Um, the gradients are driving the flow, and, and it just comes out of the uh, of mathematics. And then we start it somewhere, start it with one, it's all normalized to one. And you can solve it. And, and uh, oh, let's get the hook. There he goes. Um, and, and you can write down the solution. Okay, here it is. Implicitly, you know, um, it's not too bad actually. You know, something times R. E and F are just uh, they're constants. They're given in terms of the densities and the diffusivities. Uh, they're all determined. Um, so you've got some sort of um, something like an ellipt ellipt elliptical shape thing going on there, and you've got. Um, something times t is given you know, implicitly gives you you can solve you can solve for r and you can solve for s and then you can solve in fact going back to the definition of, of the g you can solve for m the moisture profile as well you can get it all you can get it all this way so the problem is this, this asymptotic method has allowed you to solve the whole thing uh, we're a bit surprised that it does go that far but it does it you write down the solution and so we could then graph that up and see for example. Here's the low swelling result, and then if you add swelling, what happens? You get infinite speed at the beginning as it starts to penetrate in, and then you get infinite speed at the end when the, whew, this dimensionality um, basically doing that. 
Um, so this S is the location of the wetting front starting at 1, which is the surface of the grain, and getting deeper as time goes on, going further and further and further in to the grain. There's a non-dimensional time of 1 there. So we were able to um, do some interesting mathematics on that as well. We did do some checking against, against um, fairly accurate uh, finite element solutions as well. I didn't check too closely, but we at least tried to see were there steep fronts or not. And there was some evidence of steep fronts there. And did it take uh, the right amount of time to get into the grain? So here's one quarter of an ellipsoidal rice grain. And sure, yeah, two minutes, ten minutes, twenty minutes, and it's pretty much wet all the way through. So the, the time scales were about right. Um, Look sort of geometry, and some evidence there of a, of a sharp front penetrating through into the grain, um, which set, seemed to match reasonably well with that. I said we could get M, uh, the moisture content, as a function of R and T, and here it is. Here's M, it's a negative, uh, negative, uh, we rescale to negative values, and here's R at different times, so early time, and then later, 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 later. So here's the front penetrating in, the steepness of this is the steepness of the front. And look here, there's R of T, there's R of T, there's a swelling going on as well. So there's a swelling and penetrating the formulas for that. So, all look reasonably convincing. Um, and as I say, it was fun. We did most of that in one week, but some of it was done in the months afterwards. And we wrote a paper on it, and the paper got submitted to a journal and, and it got published too. So it was, uh, it was fun. It gave some good advice, I think. We had some fun. Um, some funding arose from this too. Uh, Kerry Vanman was, was running that, that study group and worked quite closely on this, on this material too with, with us. <coughs> Excuse me. And so she got a, some funding from the government and from industry for a postdoc and for an honor student as well, a very good honor student. Um, Carlton Breweries came back the next year and wanted to know about cooking rice to a sloppy gel more, uh, more carefully and we published in that journal. And Uncle Toby's, I believe, bought their equipment much better informed than they were to start with. So, uh, um, I have since then refereed a, a thesis and some papers on wool scouring. And you want to clean wool off a sheep in Australia or New Zealand, maybe even from uh, Korea. Do you have sheep in Korea? You have some? You have more people than sheep though. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's the opposite of New Zealand. We have nearly as many sheep as you have people. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this wool scouring, you know, the wool comes off the sheep and it's greasy. And so you've got the wool that you want and the grease that you don't want. So it's a sheath over the top. Apparently grease is a long chain polymer. And when you try and uh, wash it with a hot detergent, you're trying to penetrate a long, grain, long chain polymer. It's the same problem. So these guys picked up on referenced nicely, nice to see they referenced our work and then they extended it to the cylindrical domain and, had some, and got some nice, uh, some very nice analytical solutions actually uh, from their work. Um, there's a whole area of polymer dissolution. Uh, I think when you etch, when you, uh, when you make integrated circuitry, I think you're, you're sending a uh, solvent into polymer there, uh, silicon. I, think, um, I, I believe there's a whole lot of work going on in the silicon industry. It has gone on. So it relates to some quite general stuff. And Foster's, Foster's were the ones here. That Calvin Brewery's, they make Foster's, a famous uh, Australian beer. Uh, I actually, I went, to this, I went to this next year and helped them with the cooking rice. And uh, I think on day three they brought out two beers. One was a, a Foster's made the usual way, with sugar as an adjunct. And the other beer had uh, Chinese characters on the kanji on it. And it was made using rice as an adjunct. At least the rice was the source of their sugar. So they'd take some rice, cook it up, add an enzyme that cut the, cut the long chain. So they wanted short chain. They wanted to cut the starch until it turned into sugar. So apparently if you, cut, if you cut the chains, down, you get nice sugars, uh, but different flavour. And we had the taste test, you know, taste this beer, which is Foster's, with sugar as an adjunct, the usual way, and then taste this beer, which was made in China, using rice as an adjunct. And actually, the, uh, the rice one was a, a, like a sahi dry, it was a dry beer. It tasted good. Um, it tasted different, um, the same strength, and that, but it tasted different, and it tasted like lighter and drier because of the rice, I think, yeah. So, yeah. Now, um, this, this came along um, somewhat later, in 2003, and 
And this was in um, Adelaide, wasn't it? Adelaide. So University of um, University of Adelaide. South, South University of Adelaide. No, uni, 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 University of South Australia. USA. University of South Australia in Adelaide. Um, ran, they ran the study group for four years. Like four years. Yeah. yeah, they got an extra year. What a good for us. What a good. I was very surprised. I was very surprised to see that the defence, Australian defence forces, brought us a problem. You know, I thought, what about confidentiality? What about, you know, um, have we got sufficient security clearance to know this stuff? In fact, it was the Australian Submarine Corporation, which was a company contracted to the Defence Force. And they were contracted to build a six columns class um, submarines, which are diesel powered, but when they're underwater, the diesel can't run, of course, it needs oxygen, so they use batteries underwater, even when they're down underwater. Um, and what I'm going to give you here is a mixture of the summary on Friday. Um, I'll show you something of the problem, which we'll do in the summary on Friday. But it's also, I want to show you a little bit of what happened after this, because some amazing mathematics happened after this work as well. But we've got some lovely pictures of submarines on the way as well. So um, the batteries they use are like the batteries in your car, lead acid batteries. It's a little bit more high tech. It's the same ingredients. You know, yeah, the design is more careful and they bubble water fluid. They bubble air through it to keep... These batteries are quite big, they're about one metre high. And they're about half metre by half metre wide. And that's one unit and they have lots of them. Um, and so, uh, you know, they bubble air up to keep the water, the, the um, acid, well mixed because otherwise it settles and you get a density gradient and the more acid at the bottom, less acid at the top. So. Um, so they, um, they are a little bit more high tech, there's a picture of them there, but um, this, is the present, this is pretty much the presentation I made on, on, at the, on the Friday. So you'll see some names here which you might recognise. I haven't changed this, so Ju Young is in there. And I think, oh yes, Professor Kwan is here as well, look at that. He was there. He was there. All right, so he was a, a cast of thousands. Um, <laughs> um, two guys, Giles Richardson and John King, were there from Nottingham, and these guys know a lot about um, diffusion of ions through a, a solution. They knew a lot about that, especially Giles Richardson knew a lot about it. Neil Phelps was, was also um, a key player, but, but people contributed in lots of different ways. And so you see there's quite a big group uh, there that, that, that particular year. And I showed these pictures. Um, that's Giles, and that's one of the industry representatives. Um, ah, there's Ju Young, many years ago. He's a little, a little bit older now, isn't he? But he's, I think he's, he doesn't look much, he looks just as young, I think, these days. I saw him a couple of years ago, he's looking pretty good. Um, there's John King and Giles Richardson doing some very serious mathematics on the board. So here's some of the pictures we took there. And, uh, the uh, company had asked us to help them um, to, they wanted to know how much longer the battery would last in any given situation. Um, they, they were supposed to design a system, the systems for the whole lot building the boats, the building the submarines. And um, the submarines um, were going to be run by a centralised computer system and the battery performance was, was a module that they had to write in MATLAB. They were using MATLAB. Um, and they wanted to know how to write, they wanted to know how to predict battery performance, given the history that had already happened. So they wanted a model of a lead acid battery. They wanted a predictive model under cyclic operations. So the kind of, op the kind of things that would happen is they'd have a, they showed us these pictures, you know, they start off with a battery pretty much 100% charged, and then the submarine would die. So they'd use the battery. And then they would say, okay, no, it's safe to come up. So they'd come up, they'd, suck in air, run the diesel engines, and charge the battery for a bit. But not too long, because they don't want to be exposed to the enemy for too long, so they dive again, right? So here's a series, uh, and you see they, they're losing power in the battery. And they can run it, in, and they run it down, and then usually they'll do a long charge then, once it gets a little bit low. They've got to be careful down here. Um, if you discharge a, a car battery too much, or these batteries too much, the, um, this crystal grows across, which can short out the plus and the minus, short it out completely. So yeah, the bad things can happen if you get down too low. 
they, they're not reversible anymore, they're not rechargeable anymore. Um, so that's a typical um, uh, trip made by one of these boats, or these uh, uh, submarines. And at any point in here, they would like to know, the captain of the boat would like to know, would like to question the command module and say, if I want to, how far can I go without surfacing before the batteries stop? Or how, how, you know, what combination of fast and, and other, what, what do I have to do to get to here or to engage that enemy? So, you know, what's the future performance here or here or here or here, given the history that we've had? It took, it's, apparently, it's a difficult problem. Um, there, are model, there are models around for batteries, but there were like too many models, and some of them did really badly. Um, it was non linear, uh, the cyclic operation was a problem, the all, all history, it was known that the history dependent, you get aging, and they wanted something that they could use. Code and use. I'm not sure we gave them that, but um, well, we certainly looked pretty hard at that. And, and there were three particular, you know, techniques. There's a very detailed electrochemical model, possibly, and they knew about these. Uh, there's electric models for um, sort of reservoir type arguments, and there's just purely parametric models as well. And we looked at all th all of those kind of techniques. As I say, Giles and and John from Nottingham knew a lot about electrochemistry and look particularly at that. And, uh, that was pretty exciting. Uh, what they did was pretty exciting. So we talked about batteries, conventional flooded letters in cell. The tubes are used, but they're arranged in a flat plate. So it's, it's pretty much one dimensional. Between, between any pair, plus and minus, the problem is pretty much one dimensional. Because they're sort of like one, two, or two millimeters apart, and they're half meter by half meter squared. Well, actually, half a metre by one metre, rectangular. <laughs> and then enough of them to make another half metre the other way. So, and then they bubble here, they're a little stacked, and um, to get the required voltage, I forget what the required voltage was, it's an airlift acid agitation system. So we didn't have to worry about stratification, vertical stratification. Surely just 1D to a, to a good approximation. What are called? They, uh, I think they take seawater in, they run it past these things and out again and cool the jacket around them. Quite sophisticated, um, but it's still just a car battery. Flat plate, yeah. No verbal certification. No. 1D model. So we pretty quickly realised we could get a 1D model. Um, well, I just want to give you some flavour of what happened. I'm, I'm conscious that it's quarter past five, and um, I should be finished. <laughs> so. I'll give you some, some ideas about, uh, I'm particularly excited about the detailed modelling of electrolyte transport um, between two plates. So uh, we wrote down the um, equations for the chemical reactions that occur on the positive and negative plate. And you see you've got lead and you've got sulfuric acid combining, um, coming together to give you lead sulphate, or lead oxide on the other side com combining, but again giving you lead sulphate. Uh, crucially, um, giving you some electrons or taking electrons, so you get a, a charge, a charge built up, which then flows through some circuit and keeps the um, submarine going. You can write down the equations uh, for conservation of ions. H is the H plus ion, and S is the sulfate ion. And we haven't written it down properly in this, in this reaction. I'll think of it as H plus or but S is actually a sulfate ion, and. Um, you can see there's a diffusion equation, DHDT and DHDT is proportional to a second derivative. Um, so there's a diffusivity and the temperature dependent. And that's, uh, I think it's um, Stokes-Einstein, is it? Uh, and then modify by the fact that you've got a, a potential here. So you, uh, you have a velocity here which arises, that's the Stokes-Einstein. You get a balance between the drive for the fact that you've got a positive ion in the electric field and you've got a drag from viscous viscous drag. So these velocities come from a balance, a viscous drag force balance. One for the positive ions, one for the negative ions, and then usually chemists will take charge neutrality in the middle. That, 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 that you know, if you have a, a difference between the number of ions, the density of ions, it, it's electrically unstable. It goes back to being the same amount of, a, of H plus and S minus and SO4 minus. Here yeah, S is the sulfate ion. Um, convection diffusion equation. So there's the link. <laughs> well, the con con diffusion is the link, but this is the convection there as well, isn't it? It's from the electric field. 
So um, there are a lot more equations as well because there's conservation of charge on the um, plates um, and there's the external circuitry. You know, you've got to run that charge through a, through a resistance of some sort, capacitance resistance. So all of those things had to be considered because they were all coupled together. Um, this is where I'm, gonna, I'm jumping out ahead to show you later, after more careful thought, these guys, John and, and uh, Giles from Nottingham, wrote down this set of equations, um, which are pretty much what I described. They've been non-dimensionalized, but you can see diffusion and um, advection driven by a potential gradient. Okay? And same thing for that's the, yes, so for the negative ions, positive ions, and uh, diffusion and convection. Very similar forms there. And then there's Maxwell's equations written down in terms of the, uh, the field gradient um, and a charge density. So very large or small numbers appearing here. And that corresponds to boundary layers, uh, double layers. And if you've done any chemistry, you know there's sort of electrical double layers. Only one or two um, molecules, well not molecules really, um, these things gather, they hydrate, they gather water around themselves, so you get blobs, but they're charged blobs and you get double layers. And it's all, this is really from very first principles. So there's no, what I realized later, when I went and looked at the electrochemistry and what the chemical engineers do, they never start this, this fundamental. They go back and they say, charge neutrality, yeah, yeah, convection diffusion, yeah, yeah, but, um, but charge neutrality, so this is just, that's equal to zero. Um, and then, then watch out at the electrodes because the electrodes you've got, you don't have charge neutrality, you don't have S equals H at the electrodes. You have, um, um, you have huge variations at rapid gradients in field, um, field strength and huge gradients in concentration of the ions. We wrote those down, well these guys wrote them down from first principles. Conservation of ions and, and flux to and from and, and just worked it through from first principles. Um, we later realised this. There's also there's a thing called um, well I'll tell you I'll, I'll get the name for it in a minute because yeah Butler Volmer that's what I'm trying to think of. So there's a thing called Butler Volmer equation which chemists use. They don't use these detailed ones. They, they approximate the current at an electrode. They relate it to the charge so the change of potential at the electrode. Of course, of course it's across a boundary layer at the electrode, and that's empirically done. Right, there are lots of support for it, lots of empirical uh, chemical um, experiments, lots of support for it, but it's empirical. Here, it's not being used at all. This is you know, physical, I suppose, or mathematical. And the approach of John and Giles was to say, what's well, a boundary layer at the electrodes? And we'll solve, we can solve sometimes in that boundary layer, and we can recover pretty much the empirical equations that the chemists use. The other thing that impressed me later was we we're talking about a lead acid battery here, but this theory is this for all of electrochemistry. It's not just lead acid batteries, it's any battery or any electroplating situation where you apply, where you, you cause a current by applying a charge, for example, and it makes that things electroplate. Very general, this type of other stuff is used widely and hugely. So these results that they got uh, have huge implications, I think, for chemistry, for chemical modeling. Anyway, um, the, uh, what happened there, I don't know. Gosh, that's interesting. That's all right. That's what happened. So you look at butler volmer equations, and you see um, it's one of the most fundamental relationships in electric, electrochemistry. And as I say, the work that these guys have done, and they've since published just recently this 40-page uh, manuscript, they have op obtained from first principles the butler volmer equations not by assuming the form and fitting the parameters, but by deriving from conservation of mass and charge. Uh, it's pretty impressive, I think. Um, there they are, I mean, about the volume equations. They relate uh, current and charge. There's exponential dependence. Turns out, when you look at those equations, the, the way to solve them uh, asymptotically, it's natural to think of e to the phi, you know, and exponential dependence is a natural way to solve those things. And John and Giles knew that. What's happening there, right? I need to go. So um, there's the paper. It came out in 2007. That's four years later. Um, it's in Journal of Engineering and Maths. It's very, it's quite long. Um, 40, nearly 40 pages. 
It's called Time Dependent Modeling Asymptotic and Analysis of Electrochemical Cells, quite general, Richardson and King. And it came from that work on, on submarine batteries. Very nice bit of work, a nice paper. Yeah, uh, oh yes, I pulled this out of their paper. This is where they, I sort of thought, you know, you read this paper and it's daunting, it's 40 pages. You think, what have they done? I knew what they'd done, but where do they say it? You know, and um, here they sort of say in their conclusions that another, they, did, they basically solve those, those couple, those, that very nasty system that you saw. It was, what it was about 14 or 15 equations to solve. Some were order differential equations, some were partial differential equations, but not linear. So did an outer, if you've done any um, asymptotics, there's an outer solution and there's an inner solution, right? So there's an outer solution in which you have charge neutrality, H equals S. It's so an inner solution where things, where this is no longer the case, where you get rapid variation in electric field um, and ion concentration. And they solved that approximately in some limit of dilute, of dilute uh, concentrate, dilute, uh, dilute um, acid. And so this, this is made, bulk of this paper is all this quite heavy asymptotics. It takes, a, it takes a page to write down the equations, you know. So it's it's big, it's a ton of big stuff. They they work through it, and they say, well, why do why do these calculations? What's the reason for performing these calculations? And they say it's illustrated by the method of matched asymptotic expansion. So that's the technique that's been used. You, know, you get this solution, you get that solution, and you match them. You know, there's the boundary layer, rapid change. You look at that on the expanded scale. Here's the other solution. You look at that on the normal scale, and you match them, and then you can get the whole solution approximately. To leading order and some of the very, some of the small parameters that are there. Um, how those matrix expansions can be applied to nanoscale technology, nanoscale models? Ah, it's nanotechnology. And when you see the length scales involved there, you think, yeah, that's the nanoscale, 10 to the minus 9 meters, right down there. Such as the Nernst Planck equations and our concentrated solution model to systematically derive macro scale models. So they're going from nanoscale to the macro scale using a technique that's been around for a little while. But it was difficult to use, I think, in this application. And it has implications for uh, to systematically derive macro scale models and non-intuitive boundary conditions. So that's the bottle of all the equations. The boundary condition at the you know, chemical engineers just to use a standard. They're going to do numerical solutions. They will not even try to solve those original equations. They didn't write them down. They use the bottle of all the equations. This method thus provides a way of testing nanoscale models against relatively easily obtained macroscopic measurements. Well, they've been quite modest, I think. I think it has very wide ranging implications. Anyway, um, other work was done. We did, we did just some of the you know, things you might say what about the chemical reactions on the anode and cathode? You can write down you know, ODEs for those reactions. Chemical reactions, you can write down ODEs. Turns out not to be relevant here because we're assuming that. We're waiting for the reactions to happen, but they happen fast. What we're really waiting for with car battery is for diffusion to happen. So the previous set of equations were correct or were more relevant. And these equations, which would, were written down and solved, um, assumes reactions of electrodes are the rate limiting factor. It was a wrong assumption. We later found out. So that's one of the uh, things with uh, study groups. Sometimes you make, you know, we, we go in, sometimes we're not so lucky, we're not experts in, in the field. That, for me, that had two effects. I mean, one, one, one effect was we made some mistakes. We tried something that, that failed. But the second, the other effect was Giles and John tried something from first principles and actually did something with it, where perhaps if they'd been um, experts in the area, they wouldn't have gone there. Anyway, so we've done equations and we've got solutions, and they're irrelevant because we found that. <laughs> that it wasn't really correct assumption. There's also some simple models, some nice two, you know, parametric models, storage, to try and these that developed to try and um, try and approximate the fact that you've got diffusion going on there. So if you wait and rest the battery, it recovers. You know, the diffusion has time to complete and, and, and you can build up uh, build up um, store a store charge again. Um, so these are these various and then there's very parametric equations which are written down using um, int uh, integrals which look back over how much charge has been used. So there's you know, convolutions going on there. Um, but the US Department of Energy has developed this for batteries. It's purely parametric though. And, and it's electric too. It's talking about um, voltage and current and short stored charge. And then make it a black box that's complicated enough that you can parameterize a battery and get a match to data. 
Um, the kind of data you get that I've got here, yeah, the batteries are nasty. They, they, they go fine. Here's the voltage of the battery, and boom, oh boy, that dies. And, uh, you know, after, here's the ampere hours, here's how much current you have to have a charge it. They are highly not linear in their behaviour. And where this happens is, of course, what the captain of the submarine wants to know. Am I anywhere near that point? Like, well, how can you tell? You know, that's the end of what I want to say as well. Thank you for listening. <laughs>